Bitcoin is freedom because I needed to transact between continents. Why did you choose to go out of the EU and go to Latin America? In Europe, it's totally crazy when you put everything in a, in a one basket, like a social security, and uh, you put a health insurance, which is effectively a tax. When you put all the income taxes, capital gain taxes, property taxes, and so on. Europe is under the heavy taxation. I would say it's crumbling step by step. The Europe is crumbling. Why Why they are not aware of that is because like a lot of taxes are not being called taxes. The only option how to be sovereign, how to have a freedom when shit hits the fan, so is that you have Bitcoin under your own control. Ideally, you want more citizenships, not relying on just one citizenship. You never know what's gonna happen. Having Bitcoin, you feel definitely safer than having fiat money in the bank. It's not about market cap. It's about that freedom. I don't need to have a permission to transfer for you value why is Bitcoin for you freedom money ah okay so I my perception of oh, also like how I got into the Bitcoin basically and it stuck to me till today is because for me Bitcoin is freedom because I needed uh, to transact between continents and basically because my life is mostly in Latin America it's pretty hard to go with a standard traditional payment rails and when I discovered the Bitcoin so it was the answer so then problem solved basically from day one to another day problem solved Of course, in the beginning, uh, there was no lightning network and so on, but still, you didn't have to ask any authority to say, I want to transfer $100 from one continent to another continent, waiting for five days, uh, pay what a ridiculous percent from that $100 just to rail your payment. And oftentimes it happens that it's not even arriving and they say, hey, there is a problem with the correspondent bank and it's going back to your original account so you can try it again. So uh, for me, it was a really need of transferring value from one continent to another in an easy manner without asking a permission in a couple of minutes or these days even a seconds. So yeah, there was, there was definitely the attraction for me. And you, also, so, so you got it uh, first as a payment network, the Bitcoin and not as a, oh, number go up technology, store of value, savings technology. Exactly. Like I understand the narrative of store of value. And I think that's a pretty strong narrative in, let's say, Europe and US, because like still, if you, you know it from, from your uh, side, right? If you want to make a, a payment from Austria to Spain, so then there's no problem because you make a SEPA payment and uh, it's there like within an hour and there is no fee related to that. So that's not a problem in Europe, actually. The problem becomes when we wants to do like intercontinental payments. And uh, that's why, uh, okay, store of value is nice, but that's not the, like a main point why I got into the Bitcoin. So it was like a real motivation of transferring money and not asking anybody else if I can do it or not and why I shouldn't do it and I don't like it and somebody else doesn't like that. So no asking for permission. And I know that it arrives and it's there like within... 10 minutes, let's put it this way. Yeah, that's an, a, that's an amazing feature of Bitcoin that I think gets not covered enough. Like the, the, the use case is like most people stay in their own country or in their jurisdiction their whole life, or at least they don't move uh, around too much. Uh, so they never really have to, to figure out, oh, how, how do I send a payment from, uh, I don't know, Honduras to Austria and then to Australia? Like there, there are a lot of fees involved with the fiat system, even though it's just the database entry and there's nothing physical, <laughs> uh, no physical, uh, settlement layer in, in the fiat system. At least I see it like that. Um, it's really interesting. And you also, um, moved yourself, uh, from originally, uh, Czech, uh, uh, which is really like, I can I can even hear that the check in 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 your voice uh, do now uh, to to Latin America, right? Yeah, like uh, yeah, I'm in Latin America like for 20 years. Oh wow, so so long already. Yeah. When did you come there? 
Uh, it was like 2005 or six, yeah, five, I guess. So, and, and honestly, I've tried to live in a couple of countries. So it was not just the one spot. And, and I would say it's a never ending seek for the best country where to stay, where to live. So I've already lived in a couple of the, there, I don't know, eight, nine countries uh, in Latin America. And yeah, like seeking for where is the best to stay and maybe I will never ever stay in one country. Uh, yeah, now doing it with a family and, and so yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to move to a country, try to live there, what we like about it, if we don't like it, so we move again to another one. So it's uh, yeah, never ending seeking for, I don't know, like haven, some kind of like a uh, best place where to live and where you can tick all the boxes, what we have on our kind of like a list. Uh, yeah, so there is a, and still keep going. Like, yeah, it never ended. What is that list for you? It's interesting because I uh, started that research process uh, as I'm since this year bind by a pla like till this year I was bind to a place like Austria with my job. But since this year, I'm not that anymore. So like I started like I think a month ago or two weeks ago or something like that to research about different countries and there are so many different options and it's it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, and and I I'm, I'm still in the just gathering options <laughs> phase and seeing what, what what is even possible. Um, how did you start the process? Why did you start the process? And and what is like your your list looking of like oh I want this in a country oh I want this in a country. I would say that it's gonna be a like pretty specific for every individual because like everybody has a uh, different needs and and motivations, so it's gonna be hard to like copy and paste to somebody else but okay first thing i will put it from this perspective i uh okay i end up in latin america because of uh like uh many reasons it was not a asia for me never because latin america gives me the benefits uh we speak spanish at home so uh there is no language barrier that's the first thing. Okay, except Brazil, where you need to speak Portuguese. But other than that, uh, a whole lot in America is Spanish speaking. Second thing is that you can blend in. So not just like a, from a physical appearance, how you can blend with uh, not all of them, but let's say the majority of them, you can easily blend in. Uh, also like from the cultural perspective. So it's not that different culturally, like in Latin America, let's say, compared to Europe. And uh, also, like many Latin American countries have a lot of European heritage. So there is not that big, like a clash, cultural clash that you would need to adapt to something maybe you don't like. So it's also easy. And the last part, I would say, is that I'm like seeking for freedom in terms of like real freedom. So uh, to put it into perspective, like a lot of people are putting into high on the list, like a freedom and safety. And uh, this is something what is like going against each other a little bit. So uh, I'm going to put it this way. Latin America, there are countries in Latin America that are pretty safe. Uh, obviously not, let's say, the same safety like... Uh, let's say, uh, United Emirates, right? But that's the point. So you're looking for where you have a maximum freedom and you can somehow find a crossover with some certain level of safety where you feel fine. So what I, for example, don't, about, uh, don't like about um, United Emirates is that there is a super safety everywhere. There are CCTVs everywhere. If you go like maybe 10 miles an hour faster than you should go in a car. So immediately there is going to be a fine in your mailbox and you have to pay for it. So you pay for your safety with no freedom at all. So you're tracked everywhere on every step you do and where you're going. 
and that's the difference with Latin America where you have like more freedom to do things. And I'm not talking about doing some illicit activity. So it's not an illicit activity there like doing something wrong. It's just about like nobody's like putting me in the place and saying, hey, you cannot do this and we are following you and we are watching you and you can't go that way and you need to do, go another way. So you getting safety and trying to find some crossover with uh, freedom. And that freedom on my list is definitely higher than that safety. What, what do you think of, of Switzerland as it's not in the EU as uh, more more Bitcoiners seem to, to like it, especially also with Lugano, they're adopting a lot of Bitcoin. I think in some uh, cantons you can even pay in, in Bitcoin with taxes. Like from Bitcoin perspective, I believe it's uh, going to work. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you go not that far from Switzerland in Europe, uh, in Czech Republic, uh, is that you can easily live from Bitcoin these days. So you got a more than thousand restaurants where you can pay with Bitcoin. You have like a electronics and a consumer goods, a big online store where you can pay with Bitcoin. You got a, even like a food delivery, buying a groceries where you can pay with Bitcoin or you can buy a gift card with Bitcoin that can be paid on the grocery store. So I mean like paying, uh, living from Bitcoin, it's already possible in, in Europe. Like Switzerland is not my type of country and not from a reason of like there would be that many restrictions, but I need more like vivid country where it's uh, more living, lively, something's moving. So Latin America is like closer to my heart, definitely. And second thing is that from the weather perspective, Oh man, like Switzerland is not, not my style. I mean, uh, okay. I hate winter. I hate winter totally. So for example, when you, Europe's coming to autumn and getting a little bit like snowy and frosty, it's definitely the time to leave Europe and not being in Europe till spring. So, uh, that's why Switzerland is like out of the box. Like for me, it's no go. Yeah, uh, that's that, that's a very fair assumption. I mean, I li I live kind of love. <laughs> I see Austria always the is the Switzerland with the EU, and Switzerland is kind of the Austria without the EU, <laughs> because uh, there's like landscape wise, both countries are really beautiful. It's it's very clean and very calm down. Um, I think it's a little bit more hectic in Austria, a little bit more than than in Switzerland. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I think that, but uh, Switzerland is really. A, a nice country if you want to have a, a nice, relaxed, calm life uh, with a lot of mountains and hikes and lakes and, and that kind of a life. But yeah, definitely, it's it's the, the calmness has the disadvantage of that there's not a lot going on. There's Latin America is is 100% way more lively in, in, in that regard if you value that. But from a, a perspective of, because I see it also, I, I think yesterday I saw two different posts from two different people uh one from uh, germany i forgot the other country they're saying like oh i just signed off from germany I, i'm never coming back let's see where it, it drives me i see like that that kind of shift of outside of the eu outside of canada outside of the us to uh, asia to latin america to even switzerland to, to countries like that like, why do you think is that? And why did you choose to go out of the EU and go to Latin America? Like the reason why it's happening is like, uh, European Union is becoming like overregulated. And instead of leaving it, like just on people, on a society to solve issues that might happen, like 90% of those issues can be solved even faster, better, cheaper, like within a society instead of over-regulating something because the market's going to solve it the one way or the other. So that's the problem with, uh, with the EU. If something's coming new, so we are scared, we are going to regulate it. Okay, we need to have everything under control. Uh, uh, also, like with uh, losing freedom in in European Union, uh, so all those issues are driving people outside, and they are then okay, maybe seeking for Asia or Latin America. Like I told you, Asia for me is hard to grasp because of I can't like really get in there and not being a tourist. Uh, so 
that's not my style. I'm not saying it's not possible. It's definitely possible, but not my style. Latin America is a huge continent and not maybe just a South America, but also like a Caribbean. So all that is Spanish speaking and you can just, easily move from one country to another and if you're a resident in mercosur you gotta like kind of like a similar movement of individuals like in the european union so are you a resident of one mercosur country so you can go to another mercosur country like with the id card only so you gotta really like a huge optionality within Latin America where you can move live you don't like it there you can maybe like it in another one yeah so uh, that's uh, and it, it's more laid back, like in terms of less stress, and not saying that it's everything light, but there is just a definitely lesser stress than in Europe. And the second thing, what I can find in Latin America is that there is so much things that you can build, because obviously it's not on the same level like in Europe. Uh, Latin America has a long way to grow and there are like a lot of services that are uh, missing. There there are like a lot of uh, products that are missing on the market. So you're, you're there that you can, for example, come up with your whatever startup idea and you can start implementing it in Latin America country. And definitely you're going to have a success because there's not so much competition like in the US or in Europe. And everybody's going to be happy because like those countries are with those expats that want to do something and want to contribute to the country. So those countries are growing up. They are just having a better value for for other people. Like, hey, that, that, that wasn't here like before. Now it's here. Okay, like, you know, you, you name it. Like now you can have whatever groceries uh, delivered like with a Bolt or Uber, but there is no like a good e-commerce in many countries that might be delivering like electronics or uh, other consumer stuff that's still waiting to be built. I would say I'm not, I cannot say it like generally because that's a huge country Oh, country. It's a huge continent. Like I said, but there are still countries that they are underdeveloped and have a potential. So why not? And I think there are probably a lot of uh, things that you might see now in Europe or the USA that you can bring to Latin America and, and, and close the gap a little bit. Like, as you said, the, the services and products that are missing. Really cool. How are the, the taxes there? How is the uh, tax system there? Is, is it as mad yep. as in Europe or is it way better? Uh, definitely not, but that depends country, country from country. So it's hard to generalize everything and put everything into one basket. Uh, but there are like countries, uh, two popular countries in Latin America for a lot of expats or nomads are uh, Uruguay and Paraguay. So uh, Uruguay, if you move there, you got like a tax holidays for like 11 years. So you don't have to pay taxes for, for that period of time. And in case of Paraguay, uh, there is a territorial taxation, which means uh, you pay taxes from a local income, but all the income that comes from abroad is not taxed. So it is uh, like uh, there are a lot of benefits for a lot of people. That's why there are a lot of people moving there, at least partially, because they can spend what they earned in a, abroad and spending it in the local economy, for example, or they can start building something on, on top of it. Uh, similar can be uh, other, other countries that they are also territorial taxation system. But uh, the thing is, we would need to go country by country. But if we put it like in, in the perspective that we got a like US, that is even ba uh, citizenship citizenship tax-based system, which means that anywhere in the world you live in, you need to pay taxes to the US, which is the worst case scenario. In Europe, it's uh, like a residency, tax residency-based system. But on the other hand, in Europe, it's totally crazy. You know, like one of the highest taxes probably are in the Denmark, when you put everything in a, in a one basket, like a social security, and uh, you put a health insurance, which is effectively a tax. Uh, when you put all the income taxes, capital gain taxes, property taxes, and so on. So 
Europe is under the heavy kind of like taxation. And like, you know, I'm just waiting for the moment where, I don't know if you're aware of the Loeffler curve, Loeffler curve saying like, when you reach the certain point of a taxation in percentage, so even though you raise uh, taxes higher, you're going to earn as a government less money because more and more people like start start to leave the country. So what's going to happen is that you got to the certain tipping point. It's like a kind of Gaussian curve. It goes in the middle on the top. And then you you get the maximum income from taxes. And when you reach the whatever from 40% to 50, then a lot of people say, okay, you know what? F it. I'm leaving. And they are leaving away from the country and they are starting to pay taxes anywhere else. So effectively what's happening is that the country is getting less taxes in a total value because a lot of uh, high net worth individuals are leaving the tax system. And uh, and I believe that now in, in Norway, uh, they put in effect uh, exit tax for their tax residents. So when you want to leave Norway, you have to pay exit tax, like certain amount of your assets, just to be able to lo- leave the tax system because they are scared of high net worth individuals leaving high tax country. So it's it's I, I would say it's crumbling, uh, you know, step by step. The Europe is like crumbling in that perspective. Yeah, that's that's very true, and it's. Uh, it's interesting for me, taxes, because I never thought about taxes uh, till this year. And this year I thought about it because in Austria, tax is always taken care of the uh, of the employer side uh, when you are employed. But when you're self-employed or you have a business or something like that, of course, then you have to pay the taxes yourself. You have to care of that. And just paying your taxes yourself question uh, makes you question the tax and all of a sudden uh even though you pay less than an uh, employee pays you're like oh shit no i don't want to pay that much taxes and there's like oh wait how 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 can i avoid that like how how is the other other options out there so i think like a big part of why they are not rebellions on the streets uh, especially in austria and especially in other uh, countries is because they don't even know how much taxes they pay if i ask in around in my family and friend circle and ask like, oh, uh, what's your tax rate? And they, they don't know. <laughs> they, they, they guess maybe like ballpark numbers, uh, but they don't look every month on their salary slip. They, they just know what, what comes to your, what comes to their bank account. That's what uh, matters to them. They don't know how much they, they miss out on because they pay in a high tax uh, residency. That's it's, it's, it's crazy for me. And uh, there's interesting thing that you said with the, the point where people leave. Yeah. And and another thing is like why they are not aware of that is because like a lot of taxes are not being called taxes. So that's why, you know, like if you properly put words instead of like security, like I got a health insurance. Okay. It's effectively a tax that is like being among the whole nation living in that territory. Uh, The same is it's social security. You're putting into the one basket everything. And then out of that basket, there is being paid when you are retired. But it's effectively a tax. You're paying a tax that maybe in the future you can benefit out of that. Obviously, it's it's a scheme that's not going to work in 20, 30 years. Uh, it's no way to make that happen. But uh, because of not being called tax, a lot of people don't see it as a tax. So that's one reason. And the th- second reason, uh, all people should ask, okay, if I'm paying that amount of taxes, what are you getting for it? Okay, what are you getting? Have that question, okay? That, that, I would say that's a fair question. If you're getting a, like a fair amount of services or fair amount of support for those, what, dozens of percents you're paying, and you say, okay, fine, I, I don't have a problem with that. But if you're getting nothing or really low value and you're paying a high percentage, then it's mo- not making a sense, right? So that's a good question. You said, okay, I don't even know, like, okay, I don't want to pay it, how to avoid it. Exactly, because probably you are not happy with the result, what you're getting, while what the amount you're paying, right? So there is like a discrepancy between between the payment and, and the service. There are a lot of things that I want to bring up. Uh, the first thing, because <laughs> I just love that example so much. Uh, in Austria, you have 
to pay uh, directly the local news stations uh, a fee that you have to pay si since I think like a few months or like a half a year or something like that. Uh, this was optional. If you have a television that can ha uh, can uh, get that signal, you have to pay it. But if you get rid of all your televisions and just watch online things, you could you could opt out of that. But since like a few months, it's not optional anymore. And you have to pay, I don't know, what is it? Uh, 15, 20 euros per month uh, uh, to to Austria to have a local news. And the, I, I really don't like the local news because it's also really, really, really bad. And I just got that mail that I have to pay that now like a week ago and like that that's how they promote it uh, that's just like a really small example I mean it's 15 euros uh, per month it's not like 10% of your salary but that, there are so many small examples of of that I mean social security and stuff like that is also an example of uh, of that but uh, it's 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 crazy when you really look at it and what you pay in, 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 in social security, there's like pension in there. There's like Medicare in there. And then I'm like, okay, pension. I, I have Bitcoin as pension. I don't need anything else. I, my pension is Bitcoin. So I only need Medicare. Okay. What, what do I pay for Medicare in Austria? It's depending on your salary. And then I was like, oh, that's a huge, huge thing that I'm paying. Then I'm like searching like, uh, because like maybe also Nomad and stuff like that. What are private insurances costing uh, that are covering worldwide? That's lower, <laughs> and that's that, a better that's service. A point. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 it's it's like what what are we what are we supporting here? Like uh, a huge system that has just a waterhead? Yes, that's that's I guess it is. I I, I got I can see it from both uh, sides, like your yourself and and my side, because like of course, like I I got some right relations to Europe and also living in Latin America. So uh, for example, that your tax on TV, it's the same BS uh, in Czech Republic. So it's obligatory, it's mandatory to pay for a TV, even though you don't consume that, uh, that information. Uh, and I don't know what is the amount because like, I don't live uh, in Czech Republic, so uh, I, I don't know what is the number, but still it's a tax. You have to pay it. And now, if I'm not mistaken, what happened was that they put the tax also on a mobile devices because you can consume that information from, from the TV these days on a mobile devices. So anybody who has a mobile device needs to pay the tax from that TV, whatever you call it. So it's totally BS that, I mean, like if you don't want to consume that content so they don't pay for it right but this is exactly what i think many people hate about europe because some stupid regulations are like telling you how to live your life the same is like you said with a with a healthcare it's the same same stuff you're paying not based on your health situation if you're training, if you're eating good, you're not smoking, you're not drinking, okay, your body comp composition is in a good shape, everything's uh, top-notch. So your health insurance should be based on your physical state, right? But instead of that, you're paying your health insurance based on how much you earn, which, wh wh what, how, I mean, it can't really be this way. So you can be fat, you can be whatever. Uh, I mean, like really be high uh, probability that you're going to need a medical care, but you're earning almost nothing. So basically you are not almost contributing into the system, but you are taking everything from the system. If it's based on your actual state, I mean, like everybody will be motivated to go to the gym. Everybody will be motivated to take care of their body. Everybody will be motivated to do it because their payments are going to be lower. There are incentives. If you don't have those incentives, I mean, it cannot work. So look, I, I can, I got like nine different, uh, like a global health insurance companies that can, uh, that can offer you a pretty good deal. It can be worldwide. It can be specific for certain countries. You pay a fair share based on your health and your age and, and so on. And you're definitely going to get it cheaper than paying it in, uh, in Austria. 
Absolutely. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, will Bitcoin then uh, kind of, like when we have now full Bitcoin standard and we don't have a fiat monetary standard, uh, when we look at that world, um, will that change? Will we change more in a, in a service-based government or will those kind of governments, even if, if Bitcoin is worldwide accepted, is kind of a world reserve currency, um, w will that always be that there are some states that, that have control like China or Europe or something like that? Look, I, yeah, that's a pretty good question. It's it's hard to predict what's going to happen, honestly, uh, because like I would say in the last couple of years, who would have been predicted like what's what's happening these days, right? I think that uh, my experience so far is that uh, world is not like a homogeneous, like they're, they're not uh, in a good cooperation every single, like there are 196 states or territories across the globe. And I'm telling you one thing, never ever going to happen that everybody will agree with everybody else on the same thing. So which is good and bad. Uh, I'll give you an example. The good thing is that those states cannot agree on the tiny things and not even talking about like a fin financial status or or what kind of currency will be using the country and so on. The good thing is that there is sta in a standard way there is a competition between countries. So the benefit you can take from it is that if one country is like starting to restrict, uh, regulate, uh, like creating obstacles for you. So you always find in the world probably some kind of option where you can move and there will be another country saying, ah, we will have a benefit for out of it because we can see that some countries are restricting X, so we are going to allow X. Because when we allow X, we are going to have more people in our country. We can attract people in our country. We will have them those benefits. So this is something that you can, for a future, like work with that. I'm doing it quite a lot. So, so trying to find countries where are benefits for myself, where I can see the value. And always you find some countries popping up. And for example, what one country is restricting, the other one is allowing it. Uh, on the other hand, from the Bitcoin perspective, this is the I don't know, maybe downside in terms of I'm not that big believer that it's going to happen in a close future. It's going to be like all the world's going to be working on a Bitcoin. I see it as a, like a parallel layer, parallel uh, kind of a payment rail where we don't need to have a permission to do that. And especially if you're self-custody, if you're having really your own private keys and you're going to be doing peer-to-peer -peer trades within you and me, then uh, we don't need to ask anybody. So in that manner, we are always going to have our freedom to transact. But saying that, I believe that there still will be big uh, like uh, behemoth. Uh, countries like you said, China and uh, like total, uh, totalitarian regimes that will not allow to have a Bitcoin as a currency because they will not have any kind of control over that system. So, you know, what we have now, ETFs, hey, nice. It's an investment, like kind of like I would say for Wall Street, it's kind of like a speculation, right? Hey, we can make some percents on Bitcoin. I... My guess is like a lot of them, they don't even care about it. They don't even know maybe what is a self-custody. And if they know it, they maybe heard it a little bit. But there is a, like a kind of speculation on a small asset that can grow in a total, total market, market cap value. But seeing it as a currency, I would say more like a parallel currency for maybe millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people, maybe billions of people. But 
I think like a lot of governments are going to have a problem with that. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure they are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way i also um i i think if it ever happens that bitcoin is a global standard it's, and it's only bitcoin like there is a difference between uh oh bitcoin is kind of accepted everywhere in the world uh, it's 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 to a certain extent also now like you can go in almost every country uh, exchange your bitcoin for other goods and services or for a local currency and then get goods and services so bitcoin is accepted worldwide today uh, but to a certain extent where it's there are so many great products and services where you can instantly pay with your Bitcoin. Uh, we will get there, uh, I think not that far, but to an extent where there's no other currency that will take either very long or will never happen. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I hope to believe, uh, that it's, uh, that's later that it's actually happens, but it just takes a while. Uh, but it's, it's hard to, hard to foresee because like there's really bad currencies like the Turkish lira, for example, and it still exists. <laughs> People still <laughs> use it, uh, because there's a really hard network effect around that. But yeah, it's a, it's a currency that is complete. Like everyone agrees that that's a uh, really inflated currency. We don't need that, the Turkish lira, but it, they don't change to US dollars for the same reason they don't change to Bitcoin. So it's, it's like, there, there would be so many better ways, uh, and and it will be it will be interesting how how it turns out, and and uh, it, it it will be really interesting how to, this transition goes uh, if if we get to a Bitcoin only world, uh, and if we get there, I have I have no clue about that, but I'm I'm writing my thoughts down and I'm I'm trying to figure out where it goes, and that's why I'm asking always my my guests about it. I, look, I think one more uh, one more take on that uh, is that. Like you said, if you're a Bitcoiner, and I can tell from my side, if you go to a country, even though it's not Bitcoin exception everywhere, you can always find peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, it's going to take you, even though you're new in a country, you don't know anybody there, uh, you can easily, within like one day, find somebody who's going to do a peer-to-peer -peer with you. And you can uh, just do swap for their fiat shitcoin, okay? That, so that's not an issue. If you're a Bitcoiner, it's easy. If you're like having self-custody and, and knowing this stuff, it's even easier because you're doing peer-to-peer -peer maybe in your in your city, right? And you go for a meetup and, and so on. So that's not that big 
issue for us. For normal people, it still can be because they don't know how to approach it. And uh, besides having it as a parallel kind of economy, it's a good for you as a Bitcoiner. That's also another take. Like, I mean, if you go mainstream and Bitcoin is going to happen and become a mainstream and it's going to obviously be regulations applied on every single wallet that you can have and it needs to be custodial and it needs to have a proof of keys from this address and if it's not there so you cannot interact with the old traditional system and so on which you can already see in europe right so uh you don't want to have a, just a one option in the bitcoin uh, you want to have a parallel economy where okay you can do whatever you want you have a self-custody that's the this is what we cannot lose. This is something what gives you the freedom, what's maintaining your freedom. So your freedom these days are not ETFs. Your freedom is not a Bitcoin on uh, big exchanges, right? Your Bitcoin in custodial wallet is not your Bitcoin effectively. So the only option how to be sovereign, how to have a freedom when you know shit hits the fan, so is that you have Bitcoin under your own control. You take a plane, you board a plane with a small like that device and you go 10,000 miles across the globe. You set up there and you keep going because that's cool. So this is like what we, I at least see it from that perspective. This is what we need because like regulation is going to be, regular uh, governing body is going to be here, but you need to maintain and preserve a freedom. Yeah, very true. And it's, uh, I never heard that take that it, that it might be better that not too many <laughs> <laughs> that it's not only Bitcoin, so it's not highly regulated. It's interesting take. And, and yeah, I definitely feel like Europe is going in that direction. And that's also one aspect, not only taxes and not only other, other things, because taxes, there are solutions, but the other things is like, uh, how, how is Europe going to develop and how how is Austria um, reacting to those developments in Europe? Uh, that is also something that is on my mind. That's why I'm uh, watching politics uh, too close, <laughs> yeah. Because, because uh, it, we always say like politics don't matter. That's true for Bitcoin, but it's not true for yourself. Like you, you are physical body in in that country, uh, and 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 they can uh, restrict you. Uh, and that's that's why it's I think as as an as an Bitcoin also important uh, to watch politics and what they're doing in your own country uh, with, with the regulations with the concepts they are doing. Uh, so yeah, Bitcoin obviously doesn't care about politics because Bitcoin is global, uh, as you said before. Like when there's one country that has high restrictions on Bitcoin, there will be another country that says like, oh yeah, please Bitcoiners come to me because there are no restrictions here, there are no taxes on Bitcoin. So this will always be a balance and there will not never be a, a global thing against Bitcoin. Um, but for you personally, uh, you should watch uh, what, what your country is doing to you uh, and maybe there are better options. I think that's 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 one learning for, for uh, Bitcoiners definitely because I feel like they are too like, ah, I don't care about politics. I have Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, you have Bitcoin. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, you have to uh, realize that you effectively are slave. All right. So what, what government is taking care of is that we need to have enough slaves that are from the beginning, from the day they, they are born, are being developed to contribute into the economy, pay taxes, 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 and then you die. Okay, so you're effectively slave the whole life. And especially, like you said, with the politics, uh, governments, they don't care about their own citizens. Basically, it's the politics and and... You need to be, I believe, selfish in that mode and not saying like a selfish as an individual. Maybe you will see it from the family perspective. OK, this is still like in comparison to to the whole society, it's selfishness. So your selfish unit is, let's say, family. OK, this is where you need to put like kind of, I, I would say, boundaries. And this is like your level and say, OK, so what I need to protect is the family unit. And the family unit needs to have a freedom and the family unit needs to live a life like how we want. And if we don't like something, okay, we can move somewhere else where it's totally fine. So 
you trying to preserve your freedom for a family unit. And that's why also what you need besides that Bitcoin's giving you one lack of that freedom in a transactioning. So you need to have also like a mobility of freedom. That's, that's another problem. So this is what I think about it quite a lot is I'm not relying on a one document from one country. Because like if that, again, shit hits the fan, so you're locked and then done. So you need to have like a multiple options, backup options, how you can preserve your mobility across the globe. So ideally you want more citizenships and uh, not relying on just one citizenship. You never know what's going to happen. Ideally you want those citizenships like a lot of like a part not being in the same basket like a European Union. It doesn't matter if it's going to be uh, German one and an Austrian one or Czech one or Spanish one. It's going to be the same. You need like from totally different part of the world or at least uh, some kind of like a residency permits in multiple countries and having those backup plans. Okay, so if something goes down bad here, I have the option to maintain mobility for the family or for you. It doesn't matter. But I think like that selfish look from the family perspective is really important to be ready for what's coming in future. And I don't know what's coming. I'm just saying if something bad's coming, you should be prepared for that because later it's yeah too late. I think that's a great se segue into the next uh, question that I have for you. It's like, um, what, and I think you talk, uh, think you um, thought about that well already. Um, what are some operational security basics, uh, especially when you want to secure your digital self and uh, your physical self uh, that that you know that you're like everyone should know about those basics. Okay, so that uh, okay, so that uh, OPSEC depends. Okay, what you are trying to protect against. Okay, that's that's the first definition you should be uh, clear about. Like. It's going to be a definitely totally, uh, it's going to be totally different approach uh, when you're trying to, when, you're, when your adversary is uh, three digit agencies. It's probably there's not going to be a pretty good kind of upside to that because uh, there are like really like unlimited amount of resources uh, they can get. But if, if it's like, okay, you want to be, Secure then depends if it's digital one and if it's uh, what, what's happening on the on a physical side of things. So physical side of things, I would say it depends on the country where you're trying to blend in. I like kind of like the rule of thumb that works pretty well. And because we don't want to sit here like for three hours just about like OPSEC uh, approaches are try to be a gray man. It's gray, man, you blend in. Okay, you don't want to pop up somewhere like with something that doesn't belong there. So if we go in a lot in America, okay, I've been living in Brazil. And in Brazil, uh, the OPSEC is totally different from, uh, let's say, OPSEC in Chile or, or Paraguay or Uruguay. These countries are safe. Brazil, in some certain cities, are, I would say, more dangerous. Or I've been in, in uh, Johannesburg, Johannesburg, South Africa, also not a safe city. So different approaches to that. But when you're trying to blend in, you look like the other people, you wear similar clothes, you don't uh, flash, uh, you know, expensive watch and, and uh, kind of like uh, trying to attract your, your identity to others. So then you're kind of cool. You're trying to do whatever uh, body else is doing. I don't know, normally in Latin America, let's say in Brazil, oftentimes it happening that when you've got a phone in your hand, it's definitely tourist. Uh, locals not using much phones, like let's say in a, in a subway or in a public transport uh, because it's dangerous. So nobody's doing it. Some countries, for example, they got a like curfew after, after the sunset, nobody's, uh, you know, leaving outside a house. So if you are outside, you're probably not local and so on. So you need to do your job identify threats, identify the lifestyle, identify what the locals are doing. And uh, you put it into a sheet, you, okay, orientate yourself in that and you try to blend into that. So then you're pretty fine. This is like a rule of thumb, gray man. 
in digital identity, yeah, like there are so many things you can do, but uh, definitely, like uh, if we talk about Bitcoin, I mentioned it, uh, good hardware wallet with a, a good uh, uh, additional layers of security. So I would say if you really want to be secure, uh, kind of like a Shamir backup or or having a multisig uh, solution to your Bitcoins, depending, okay, what, what what is the worth of Bitcoin, if it makes sense to put it in place, or some sort of passphrases that are creating another uh, plausible, deniable account and so on. So this is like a Bitcoin side of things. Definitely don't rely on a custodial solutions because you never know what's going to happen. Uh, and apart from that, I would say that's a good rabbit hole for everybody to start just studying, okay, how I can secure my digital uh, identity. So password managers, okay, two, two OTPs, like uh, second layer pro uh, changing codes, uh, uh, then, uh, you know, like hardened browsers, maybe using like a Linux based system on a phone, I would say a Graphene OS with, uh, with everything hardened and so on. So then, then it's a, like another kind of like a rabbit hole where to dig in and how to be more secure and not a threat and uh, trying to escape from all those fingerprinting and cookies and, and identifying your devices and preserve a little bit more privacy. Uh, it's not going to be 100% obviously, but it's a pretty good step uh, to have a better privacy in that sense. And uh, yeah, from the security perspective, use password managers and TOTPs at least. Do, do you have a, um, uh, an emergency plan where you're like, oh, when, when my country turns into shit, uh, I have an emergency pack and then I just leave or uh, something like that. I mean, double residency, something like that you already mentioned. Yeah, like uh, I think everybody should have that, honestly. So yeah. Okay, I, I okay, I live in a backpack uh, the whole life, so I got a pretty good one. Uh, I also got an article about backpack, what I've selected and why I'm using it, and what I have in my EDC. Okay, so I got an everyday carry and what I'm carrying in that, and and it's kind of like a I would say crossover between emergency bag and a, like a daily driver because sometimes shit happens during the day, so uh, you know it can be something pretty stupid. Uh, I mean. I don't know, you can be uh, like uh, in a car crash, okay? Or somebody had a car crash, for example. So you need to stop. Okay, so I got a, like a emergency shears that can cut through clothes. I can, I got a gloves because something's going to probably be sharp so I can just break the window. Uh, uh, I got a blanket, like I, that blanket is like size of five centimeters or so when you, when you roll it together and it's a, it's an aluminum blanket. So it's also thermal blanket and so on. So you, I got kind of the crossover, but besides of that, I got an emergency backpack, the big one that I can leave my premises within like 30, yeah, 30, 40 seconds. Oh, that's, that's an interesting, uh, interesting insight. Really cool. I think that those things are really, uh, Im important, uh, to at least think about the, the, the situations, like what, what are, what are you trying to protect from? What are you trying to accomplish? And then, okay, how can I solve that? Because like security is never 100%, but you can do, uh, as, as much as possible, uh, to prevent bad things from from happening there uh, it's really really cool do you have um do you have an unexpected uh, lesson or some unconventional tool for for opsec that you you found uh helpful that you kind of can share or is something that that is uh, that is unconventional uh, or is an unexpected that you that you had to enhance your freedom on the, or you have some or also from moving maybe to latin america hmm uh, there are there are so many things, man. Uh, but uh, let me let, let let me think about it a little bit. What might be unconventional? What I'm doing? Okay, uh, it's more about security. Uh, so I don't think you are gonna need it that much probably in Austria. But uh, I always wear a small dagger. It's a like really tiny dagger that is on my neck. So this is like last resort of like you know you are being mocked or whatever. So if you're being mocked, so still it's much better. Okay, uh, first step, what, what, what I'm trying to do always is when you're being mocked, have like uh, whatever, 
like fifty dollars in your pocket. Okay, not in your wallet, but in your pocket. So, in many countries, it's a substantial amount. And and uh, when you're being mocked, so you just take out those fifty dollars, and you know it's uh, always a game of probability. So even those attackers are playing against the time. So when you're being mocked, so when you have hey here's the fifty dollars, so normally they jump on a motorbike and they just leave. So it's much safer, honestly, to deal this this way than trying to protect and maybe in your backpack, maybe on your body, something else is something more valuable than those 50 bucks. So this is like how to evade, uh, like, like trying to get out of the like shitty situation easily. But uh, then you can like, okay, hey, here are more stuff if something goes wrong. And if it's really go wrong, and you have to you have no other option so you i got a dagger because that's a really small dagger that can do a lot of damage and if you don't have any other option so better to have something than nothing so yeah using that and uh another thing is i got a belt and that belt is like double layer so you can stuff your fiat cash in that double layer belt and uh so again you don't need it probably in austria but uh, in latin america it's pretty good to have especially in some countries where they are not that safe and uh, nobody is normally stealing your belt. I mean, like they may, might steal your shoes, but I never heard that, okay, you're playing against some probability, but normally nobody's stealing belts. G give me your belt. <laughs> never heard that. <laughs> uh, that, that that's, a, that's a great learning. Uh, thank you. Um, before we come to the end routine uh, of the podcast, I always have one question uh, that every one of my guests uh, gets. Uh, and the question for you is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin, OPSEC, and all the things that we already uh, talked about? Hmm. Wow, this is a tough one. I don't know. Like, yeah. Uh about Latin America, about those, uh, like I'm, I'm pretty dig down, uh, a lot of time in those optionalities in mobility. So I'm trying to seek for where to have another identities, like which countries, where it makes sense, where are low requirements on people to fulfill those requirements, because this is what you want. You don't want to have a lot of requirements as, 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 in another country or where it's making a, like a good benefit for you as a, okay, this is it beneficial to be in that country as a resident or as a citizen? Okay. What it brings me, what it gives me. And on the other hand, what it uh, requires from me, that government, let's say, or that country. So trying to find the routes uh, in that manner and combine it with, uh, yeah, other services across globe uh, with, uh, to have more freedom. So obviously, if you can live just from Bitcoin, it's from the pr payment perspective, it's the best way you can do and just get rid of a fiat standard payment rails. Some people cannot do that. And for example, for them, they need to stick with the standard fiat system. And in that case, searching for payment processors or banks that are friendlier compared to, let's say, European ones, that are pretty pain, big pain in the ass and using in another jurisdictions, banks that allowing, let's say, uh, citizens from not just European Union, but from, from other countries to open a bank account or, or some kind of crossover from crypto into the fiat through like a fintech that is uh, having easier policies because of uh, not being regulated, let's say, in the European Union because they don't offer services in the European Union. So kind of like I would say it's like multiple steps in, uh, okay, where is your mobility? Do you have enough mobility? Okay, how are you handling payments, like exchanging values with the other ones? Okay, how are you going to run the business uh, globally or even in your country? What is the best benefit to run the business uh from a tax perspective, uh, also like administrative perspective that you don't have to deal with so much bureaucracy. Uh, okay, what is your health insurance like you mentioned, right? Uh, okay, what might be the best uh, cell phone operator to use globally, even though you might use it in Europe, but there are definitely better cell phone operators outside Europe for Europe 
than the from Europe for Europe. So this is also also possible to outsource from another jurisdiction and so on. So you're trying to put like a puzzles together and it should create the whole picture, right? So, and definitely Bitcoin is one big part out of it. Yeah, the, uh, decentralizing your finances is, I think, the the first and most uh, fundamental step towards it. Uh, taking your the ability to take your financial energy over country borders is just amazing, and and nobody can can stop you from that. They they can try to tax you outside of their jurisdiction, but the the physical moving is 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 amazing. Uh, it's like go go to a count, go to any border, uh, fly, try to fly with like a, a kilo of gold or or a like suitcase a, with a cash, a suitcase of cash. Yeah, like they, <laughs> they they will stop you. They will assume that that cash is not belonging to you that they will assume that you did something illegal with it exactly uh so it's it's uh it's, it's fascinating to see so like bitcoin uh in worst case scenario you can even save it in your head uh even though i <laughs> never recommend that but you can you can do that go over borders and, and put it on a, in a self custody solution a good one bitcoin has a lot of options and it's it's great for freedom and 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 for your own prosperity I, I i like it a lot from that perspective honestly i feel safer like when you are enough time in bitcoin and and you're i would say maybe you studied enough okay and you no, i'm not saying enough but let's say at least a certain amount of hundreds of hours and you're after the years getting more and more comfortable with bitcoin uh and you think about like a future what can really go wrong then Having Bitcoin, you feel definitely safer than having fiat money in the bank, honestly. Like in my perspective, like you can have a sound sleep because, okay, the protocol itself can have a bug. The protocol itself can have some issues. We know that because it's still a code that is running. But on the other hand, this is still a better uh, kind of like a risk reward ratio than to just uh, relying on a standard fiat over-regulated banks where your fiat money that is not even yours are sitting and you need to ask for permission to use them and, or to withdraw them. And when you're withdrawing them, they are asking you why you need to withdraw it. And maybe they will do something wrong that you bought a bottle of whiskey in a wrong time. And they say, okay, we are not going to give you that cash because you did something you shouldn't have done before. So from their perspective, asking for permission to use your own money uh, versus having it totally under control, that gives me a better sleep and it's still better risk reward ratio. And I think everybody will get into that point when you're enough time in Bitcoin. I truly think so too. Um, I love it a lot. And we already, uh, unfortunately, at the end of the podcast, and it was always, uh, already a, a pleasure talking with you. Uh, last thing, we have the end routine uh, of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And your question is, how do you see Bitcoin fit in human history? Say it again. How do you see Bitcoin fit in human history? Ooh, how do you see Bitcoin fit in human history? Yeah, wow, that, that, that is a, one of the most uh, incredible inventions like we've, uh, we've had. I mean, like, uh, it's totally mind blowing. Uh, I think, like, uh, in the future, that's going to be in a history books. Uh, and I mean, it's not about market cap. Uh, I don't, honestly, you need certain market cap to be uh, using enough by people, but it's not about, about that if it's a 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, whatever number. It's about that freedom. This is what struck me at first when I came into the Bitcoin. It's still here. It never changed. So this is going to be in history books because of the first payment method that I don't need to have a permission that to transfer you value and uh, I can do it even if you like it or you don't like it I can do it with somebody that most of people say it's uh, it's a no persona non grata and and so on and that person shouldn't be included with to be able to transact with anybody else I can still do it in Bitcoin and that's the beauty because nobody can say 
Yes, you are good. You are bad. Okay, that's 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 the beauty of the system. Everybody can use it. The good ones, the bad ones, and that's why it's going to be in the history books. Very true. I love it a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Jan, for for being on my show. It, it was a pleasure talking with you. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions, uh, and uh, read more about you? All right. Uh, first thing, uh, thanks for having me because, like, uh, your show is totally awesome, and uh, and I like it. I saw a, a show with. Uh, Matej Jacques from Trezor, and obviously with Michael Saylor, I listened to that one. Uh, with Nico, it's it's awesome. I like it a lot. Uh, what you're doing, so keep 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 doing it, please. Uh, it's it's much needed uh, in that space. And people can find me on a Twitter. So I'm Stalian Del Sur on Twitter. Uh, maybe you can put it in your show notes. And uh, and also I'm I am running the websites that are hackinglives.com. So it's a hackinglives.com, everything together. Uh, yeah, where I have a blog, so writing something about, like you asked me about EDC backpack and about privacy and about mobility and some kind of hacks that uh, people can use and, and, and so on. So it's a, like multiple topics, OPSEC, that I like i like to study i like to explore test it on myself so everything's there so people can look amazing yeah thank you also for for the nice compliment i i will definitely uh keep doing it i'm i'm i i consider it just starting out actually right now i'm doing it now a little bit over eight months i think like eight months and a few days uh so uh, a lot more years to come and uh, i love it a lot and thank you for watching also and um, also thank you for everyone that is now watching and listening to the podcast as always i'll be back tomorrow with another episode bye bye thank you bye bye